open your copy of the Word today to Revelation chapter 1. It's only fitting that as we continue this series of a little over 20 messages, I believe, that we've had in this counterculture series, that we finish today in the Revelation with a great man of God. Revelation chapter 1, I'm going to begin reading at verse 9 here in just a few moments. That song was a good way to set the table to think about Perhaps just put in your own mind, think about being somebody that would follow Jesus after his baptism in the Jordan River and then following the Lord Jesus Christ, him coming and finding you and saying, hey, come and follow me. Then you're leaving your livelihood behind and going and following the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes it might be down dusty roads. Sometimes it might be along hillsides. Sometimes you might follow him into the crowds. Sometimes you might follow him into places of seclusion. Think about the teaching. Think about the authority and the power with which Christ spoke. Think about the great and awesome miracles that he did. And as you follow Jesus for three or four years, you get to witness all these things firsthand. And then imagine to yourself being led by Christ across the Kadron Valley to a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. Imagine attempting to pray with Christ but being so weary and falling asleep. But imagine being awakened by a temple guard as they come in and they apprehend Jesus and they drag him back across the Kadron Valley to the home of Caiaphas and they're from a distance. You have to hear Jesus condemned for sedition, for blasphemy. And then you follow at a distance as he's led before Pilate, not once but twice, and then finally he's condemned to death for his sedition against the Roman Empire. And then imagine following Jesus to a place called the Praetorium where Jesus would have been beaten just about beyond recognition. And then imagine following with the mother of Jesus as he carries the cross all the way out to a place called Calvary, Golgotha, the place of the skull. Imagine Jesus being nailed to a cross and hung between two thieves, and there you are standing next to the mother of Jesus. Get that picture in your mind for just a minute. Jesus says a few words from the cross. But then he looks down at you and he looks at his mother. And he says, Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. And it's not too long before you see Jesus take his last breath. It's not too much longer till Joseph of Arimathea takes down the body of Jesus and buries him in his own tomb, a tomb that he had made for himself. Imagine on that Friday the despair you must have felt. The hurt and the pain. Friday, Saturday, your friend, your master, your savior, whom you loved dearly, is gone. But then imagine the joy you must have felt on Sunday morning when some women came in and reported that Jesus was not at his tomb. And then you go and you inspect the situation for yourself. You run to the tomb and when you get there you find angels and the angels have this report. He's not here because he's risen just as he said he would be. And then joy and hope begins to flood your soul. And it's not too much longer until Jesus begins to appear to you and to the rest of the disciples and to report to you the good news. I am not dead. I am alive forevermore. And the sweetness of the fellowship that you must have had with Jesus over that period of 40 days until finally He led you to the Mount of Olives And there you see Jesus begin to ascend up into the heavens. And then, ten days later, there you are, 
gathered with the rest of the apostles. And then a noise, a rattling begins to come into the room that you're in. It's the sound of a mighty rushing wind. On the day of Pentecost, as the Holy Spirit begins to blow across the room and to fill your souls and a tongue of fire is set down upon you and you begin to preach the gospel in another language and thousands of people come to faith in Jesus Christ and are baptized. And imagine how you must have felt as before your very eyes the church is being born and the mission of the Lord Jesus that He left you with has commenced. Now fast forward a few years beyond that. You've been witnessing for Christ. You've been preaching the gospel. Helping to plant churches. Doing everything you can to fulfill the mission of your Savior, Jesus. And for your testimony for Christ and your testimony according to His holy word. You were taken. You were apprehended by the Romans. Because you refuse to worship a Caesar because your only God is the Lord and His Christ. And so they take you, friend, and they put you in exile on a little island that's only about 13 square miles. It's called Patmos. It's rocky. And so they actually use it for a rock quarry. And there you fully expect to spend the rest of the days of your life. Now, you're an old man at this point. So you don't have much time left. And there you are in exile. So what do you do? You do the only thing that you can do. You keep loving God. You keep praying. You keep worshiping and serving the Lord including on the Lord's Day, on the first day of the week. And today, church, that's where we pick up the story of the Apostle John. Worshiping Jesus on the Lord's Day. And by the grace of God Himself, Jesus Christ showed up. And John begins to focus on Jesus. Let me read it for you. Revelation chapter 1 beginning at verse 9. If you're there, say amen. Amen. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. It was serving God that got him put in exile, church. Haven't we seen that over and over and over again? I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, that is to Ephesus, to Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And then I turned... To see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. And his head and hair were like white like as wool and white as snow and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he laid his right, and in in his, he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. 
And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which are to take place after this. The mystery church of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. What a picture. What a revelation. At the very beginning of the revelation, John gets the greatest revelation of all, and that is Jesus himself. He is the greatest revelation. Number one, let's go back and look at it today. Because my hope is that what I'm going to show you today is Jesus Christ resurrected, radiant in all of His glory so that you will be compelled to continue to live counterculture because you understand this Christ, this Jesus, this Savior is King of kings and Lord of lords. Number one, let's talk about the voice of Jesus. Verses 10 through 12. Have you ever wondered what it would be like for Jesus to speak to you? <laughs> well, John heard Him. And he said in verse 10, I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. Now we know there are times that God speaks in a quiet, soft voice, right? I take, for instance, when Elijah tucked his tail between his legs and ran to a cave across the Jezreel Valley and he's hiding out because he's afraid of that wicked queen Jezebel. And the Bible says an earthquake went across the face of the cave and shook the foundations and then a fire and then a great tempest went across the face of the cave but there was no voice in the midst of all the turbulence and the noise. But then after all the calamity, 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 11, a still small voice. And that's the voice of God compelling Elijah out of the cave and back to the mission that God had called him to do. So sometimes God surely does speak to us in a still, small voice. And yet in this case, I want you to understand that John is getting a different picture of Jesus. This is not the babe that was born to the Virgin Mary that was wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in the manger. Oh yes, it's the same Jesus. But now he gives us a different revelation because here's the awesome truth of the matter. The Bible says in John chapter 1, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Greek says God was the Word. But then you get down to verse 14. Now keep in mind, this is the same John who's got the revelation right here. He says in his gospel, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, our English translation says, that actually we have no way in our English language really of trying to capture the fullness of what the Greek says there except to say it like this. The word in Greek is eskenosin, and the, the root word is skene. Skene means tent. John literally says to us that the Word became flesh and in becoming flesh, He tented among us. That is to say, He tabernacled among us. Now hang with me for a second. What was the tabernacle to the Jewish people in the Old Testament? It was the dwelling place, it was the, re the housing place of the Ark of the Covenant and by virtue of that, of the presence of God. Here's what God would do from time to time. He would come down into the Ark of the Covenant, on top of the Ark of the Covenant, to the mercy seat on the most holy place. And He would allow His radiant glory, His Shekinah glory as the Jewish people say, to fill the temple. That was the physical, tangible manifestation of the presence of God. It was His glory. Well, what did the tabernacle do, church? It shielded the people from the glory. Now you think about that for just a second. Jesus is God the Son. He has eternally existed with God His Father. And His radiant glory has illuminated all throughout the heavens. And yet, 
When God the Father decided to send His Son Jesus into the world, He sent Him to this world not as an animal, not as an angel, not as any of those things, but as a fully human man. God, the one Jesus who was fully God, became fully man. He took on human flesh. Now listen to me. Here's what the flesh of Jesus did. One of the things it did was it veiled us from the glory of God. Can you imagine what it would have been like for those fishermen, the disciples, everybody who came into the presence of Jesus? His parents, if Jesus had been born in His fully radiant form without any kind of veil over His glory, there's no way they could have comprehended it. There's no way they could have coexisted with it. So when God sent His Son to the earth, He put flesh on him, he became fully human. And that humanity, that flesh, veiled the glory of God. You say, preacher, I don't understand. Help me understand. Well, it's like this. Remember Peter and James and John in the Gospel of Matthew were taken up onto a high mount by Jesus, the Bible says. And when they got there... Jesus, His face, His countenance begin to radiate like glorious white bright light, like wool, the Bible says. And when that happened, that Jesus was in the presence of Moses and of Elijah. Have you ever read this before? Jesus was in the presence of Moses and Elijah. I think Moses representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets. Can you imagine what their conversation must have been like? <laughs> Jesus and Moses and Elijah. And to his credit, Peter says this. Lord, it's good that you brought us here. Will you let us build you a tabernacle and Moses a tabernacle and Elijah a tabernacle? And just about the time Peter said that, a voice came crying out from the heavens. This is my beloved son. Hear him. And they all fell down like dead men. And Jesus said, guys, don't be afraid. It's me. And with that, Moses and Elijah were gone. See what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration is that Jesus allowed the veil of his humanity to be pulled back a little bit. And when he did, the radiant glory of his countenance began to be revealed on that mountain of transfiguration. See, what I'm saying to you is that Mary and Joseph and all of us, we have the memory of Jesus in His humanity, and rightfully so, because He's precious to us. He's our Savior, and He took all of our infirmity and all of our sin, and He bore it all the way up to Calvary, and He paid the debt for our sins. So we remember Jesus in His humanity, that humble, meek son of a carpenter, who would put children up on his lap and say, unless you are converted as unto a little child, you'll not enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's our recollection of Jesus from the Gospels. And rightfully so, it's precious. But we have very few times in the Bible where Jesus reveals himself in all of his radiant glory, glorified. That's what we're dealing with here today. That's what John was dealing with. He was in the very presence of his King, of his radiant Savior, Jesus Christ. He got a glimpse of Christ's glory. And I think he come to understand when he heard the voice of Jesus rushing like many waters, like a loud trumpet. I think he came to understand that he was in the presence of his Creator. You ever go to the Smoky Mountains, do any hiking? We don't get to do it very often, but that's one of the things sometimes I'll take the family and we'll go do. I love to go somewhere like Laurel Falls or Grotta Falls or somewhere like that. See, for big boys like me, you got to have something at the end. You know what I'm saying? To kind of compel you to, to keep going. So when you get to the end of the hike, you know that there's a waterfall there, right? And when you get to the waterfall, and I think, I can't remember if it's, I believe it's Grotta Falls, I believe where there's actually one there where I've been there where you can go and the fall, the water is falling down off the rocks and you can walk behind the waterfall. 
I mean, we're blessed to live in East Tennessee, amen, the Great Smoky Mountains being right here. What I love is when you're just standing there, you just hear the water falling down, gallons and gallons, hundreds and thousands of gallons of water falling off and pounding down on the rocks, and it's just like a, a, a mighty rush coming down off the rocks and falling down to the ground. You know how sweet, how precious that sound is. That must have been the sweet and precious and awesome sound that John heard as he began to listen to Jesus speak. He understood very quickly he was in the presence of the King of glory. And what an awesome thing that is for us to see and to behold today. That's the voice of Jesus. Number two. Let me talk to you now about the identity of Jesus, verses 11, 17 through 18. Several things here. I love it when Jesus identifies himself because, man, he tells us some awesome things about himself. And what does he say first? He says there, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Okay, that sounds great. I've heard that before. But what does it mean? Well, if my recollection is correct, I believe the Greek alphabet has 22 letters in it. And the first letter in the Greek alphabet is the Alpha. And the last is the Omega. So in case we were wondering what it is that Jesus was saying when he identified himself like this, he even clarifies it. He says, I am the first and I am the last. Now what does that mean? That's Jesus telling us that he is the creator of everything. The realm that we live in right now is the realm of space and time and matter and disease and finiteness and naturality. See, that's that's the world that we live in right now. Well, guess what? Jesus created all of this. So he's saying from the beginning of all things, don't you believe for one second, 13.8 billion years ago, there was nothing, and then out of nothing, everything just popped up, and we evolved to where we are right now. Beloved, that's not how it happened. The Word of God tells us plainly, clearly how it happened, that our God, in fact, specifically our Savior, Jesus Christ, the Bible says, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, everything that has been made was made by Him. And for him, Jesus created everything in six days and on the seventh day he rested. That means he is the alpha. He is the beginning of all things. Well, what does it mean though that he is the omega, that he is the end? That means that at the end of time, when this realm of space and time and matter goes away... Just as Jesus made all things new at the beginning of time, He's going to make things new again at the end of time. He is the bookends of creation. He is the beginning and He's the end. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last. The one by whom everything has been made and sustained by the power of His Word. That's Jesus. The Bible also says here, Jesus identifies himself. He says, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. So Jesus, even in his identification, shares with us the gospel. He reflects back on it. He says, look, I actually died. Do you know that there are liberal theologians throughout the 20th century who came up with various theories of the resurrection? And one of those theories was called the swoon theory. That is to say that Jesus, when he was crucified and tortured and beaten beyond recognition, that when they took him down from the cross and they buried him in the tomb, they thought the man was dead. But in actuality, he wasn't dead. He just swooned death. He had a revival in his spirit. His life came back to him. And so he got up being bloodied and battered and bruised. And he somehow moved the stone out of the way and presented himself alive to the disciples. They thought he died, but he never actually died. Now that's what some people would have us to believe. We got a good old-fashioned East Tennessee word for that. Amen? Hogwash. That's not what the Bible says. Jesus said, look, I was dead. But I didn't stay dead, amen? He was dead, 
He resurrected back to life on the third day. He rose victorious from the dead, giving us hope of life beyond the grave. And then Jesus says, not only am I alive now, John, but I am alive forevermore. Jesus says, I am the everlasting God. And then what else does he say about himself? He says, I have the keys of Hades and of death. You say, now what does that mean, preacher? Well, keep in mind that Jesus was ministering in the Greco-Roman period. So he would even use analogies and words that they would understand. And one word that they certainly understood, we all know what death means, but what is Hades? Well, the Greeks believed that when a person died, that initiated their entrance into the underworld and to the other life, I guess you might say, and they called that Hades. So this is Jesus using one of their own analogies to help them understand, I have conquered death, I have conquered sin, I have conquered the grave, the keys of heaven are in my hand, and if anybody will trust that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, they can receive the grace of God and gain entrance into heaven because of the finished work of Jesus. That's what Christ is saying. All these awesome things Jesus tells us about himself. The Alpha, the Omega, the King of glory. What an awesome Savior we serve. Number three, that's the identity of Jesus. Let's talk about now the radiance of Jesus, verses 13 through 16. Bible says there in the midst of the seven lampstands, there was one likened to the Son of Man. Isn't that interesting that we find that in Revelation? Because we find the same thing. In Daniel chapter 3, when Nebuchadnezzar was enraged because those three Jewish young boys, young men, would not bow down and worship the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, he said, I want you to heat that furnace hotter than it's ever been, and I want you to take them down there. I want you to throw them in the fire. Bible says that when the guards got the boys down there and threw them in, that they actually got set on fire themselves and they died trying to throw the prisoners into their death in the flame. Well, something amazing happened. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the Bible says were not consumed by the fire. Instead, they were walking around inside the flame. You say, preacher, you actually believe that absolutely with all of my heart. I made a decision a long time ago. If I could believe that the Bible says in the beginning, God, I could accept anything after that. And my God is able to keep those three Jewish boys alive inside that flame. And not only that, the Bible says that there was one, Nebuchadnezzar said, Look, there's one like unto the Son of Man inside that fire with those boys. Wonder who that was. I believe it was Jesus. Because the Bible says here, look, there's one like the Son of Man. We are talking about Jesus Christ, the one who is Lord over all of the elements, over all of nature. Jesus. In fact, did you know that Jesus' favorite term, his favorite designation for himself throughout the Gospels was not Son of God, though he certainly is the Son of God. Christ's favorite designation for himself was Son of Man. He's taken up all of our infirmities, all of our diseases. And by His grace, we have been healed of our sin sickness. He's the Son of Man. Notice also, Scripture John says, He was clothed with a garment down to His feet, a garment to His feet. That is to say that Jesus is completely and perfectly whole. Here in this glorified picture of Jesus, we we see no signs of His suffering. And I think there's no doubt this garment that he's got on is probably a robe of majesty because truly we know he is King of kings and Lord of lords. And when Isaiah got his picture of the throne room of heaven in Isaiah chapter 6, the Bible says the train of his robe filled the temple. We are talking about the majestic, perfectly whole King of glory. No lack, no deficiency, no need of anybody or anything. That's Jesus. The Bible also says here that he was girded about the chest with a golden band. You say, Pastor, I don't understand. What does that mean? Well, the priests and the prophets of the Old Testament, they were used to wearing a girded or a band girded around their, their chest 
Some of those bands were colorful. Some of them were made of leather. But none of the bands that would have been worn by a priest or a prophet would have been made of pure gold. We are talking about a golden band that is reserved only for Jesus. Let me ask you, why would the golden band be reserved only for Christ? Because he is a prophet according to the order of Melchizedek, the Bible says in Hebrews. You say, what does that mean? That means that Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. The golden band is reserved for him. And for him alone, the Bible says. Scripture also says, John describing him says, His head and his hair were white like wool. They were white as snow. Didn't we have a little snow this past week? (laughs) This points us to the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one whose glory is going to radiate throughout the new Jerusalem so that when we come to heaven at the end of time, as we've reflected on so many times before, there won't be any need of sun or moon or stars in heaven. His radiance, His whiteness, His glory is going to illuminate all of eternity. And the sun and the moon and the stars will be just an afterthought when we live in the light of His glory. His glory, His perfection here reminds us that Jesus is spotless and sinless. He was at all points tempted, yet He was never tainted or touched by sin. Now look at this one. John says here about His eyes. Watch this. He says, His eyes were like a flame of fire. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, fire, we know, is an element that separates the pure from the defiled. You take a piece of metal, you put a fire underneath it, put it in a crucible. Well, the impurity rises to the top. It separates the the pure from the impure. So when Jesus has eyes that are like a flame of fire, what does that mean? Well, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it's appointed a man once to die and after that the judgment. Every one of us, male, female, old, young, rich, poor, doesn't matter. When our time comes, and the Lord only knows when that time is, and we breathe our last breath, When we come into the hereafter and we step before the throne of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we are going to receive our judgment. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, that we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive those things for which have been done in the body. Well, the Apostle Paul gives us a little bit more detail. I don't know exactly what this is going to be like, and any pastor tells you he does, they're just telling stories. All we know is what the scripture says and we reveal what God has revealed to us. But there's so many details I think that God has not even shared yet. (laughs) But what he has shared is awesome because here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to stand before him in judgment. And Jesus with his refining eyes of fire, keep in mind, is going to look down over the work of our life. Our thoughts our actions, our intents, all the things of our heart, all the things that we've done, Jesus is going to look down on all of that. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, beginning at verse 11, some of those things are gold and silver and precious stones. Those are good things. Those are precious things to us, right? We keep those things locked up because they're valuable. They they mean a lot to us. So that's, that's good stuff. But then Paul also says that when Jesus looks down, he will see the wood, the hay, and the stubble. What does that mean? That means for me, there's some things that I've done in my life that were done for the glory of God. That were done out of faithfulness to God. And the Lord Jesus is going to see that and there will be reward for that work. But there's also going to be some things that I've done in my life that I'm not proud of at all. And there's sin and wickedness. That's the wood, the hay, and the stubble. And you can fake it to everybody else. You can put a mask over stuff. 
But there will not be any fooling Jesus on the day of judgment. Because His eyes are going to see through it all. Now I want to put your mind at ease because that's a, that's a troubling thought for all of us, I'm sure. It should be. But I do want to assure you of this. When you stand at the judgment seat of Christ, if you have placed your faith in Jesus and you have no question, no doubt in your mind, if you have genuinely received the grace of God through faith in Jesus, your salvation, your eternity will not be in question when you stand before Jesus. Thank the Lord. You can be certain of your salvation, of your home forever in heaven, if in fact you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ and been born again. But that does not mean now that we are at liberty to live however we want to live. When you signed up for Christ, what you were signing up for was to love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. And if you genuinely do that, your life will be radically altered as a result of that. And we'll give an account one of these days to Christ for what we did with Jesus since we've been born again. It's been about 35 or 36 years for me that I've been born again. And one of these days, the Lord's going to want to know, what did you do with Jesus after you were born again? Who would you share him with? Did you attempt to reach others for Christ? See, Jesus is going to see through all that. His refining eyes. The Bible also says here, John says, His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. So these brass feet of Jesus that we're talking about represent the judgment that will soon be meted out all over the earth. We see right now we live in a world that is hostile to Jesus. It is hostile to Christianity, to the gospel, to the truth. We see more and more attempts being made every day to censor the truth and to persecute churches and to stop the gospel and to bring in a wicked new world order that is going to be manipulated by Antichrist at the end of time to try and send as many people to possible as hell, to, to, to hell as possible. And with that being the case, with that being the case, there's little time left to continue to share our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. But here's what a prophecy that was given in Genesis chapter 3, the very first preaching of the gospel. From the Garden of Eden, here's what God pronounced to the serpent. He said, on your belly you shall go. He said, you shall bruise his heel. You shall bruise the heel of the coming Messiah, Jesus. And didn't, didn't the serpent, didn't the devil do that? Didn't he temporarily wound Jesus on the cross? Absolutely. Absolutely. But for the serpent, he was not able to deal a fatal blow to Jesus because you know what the rest of the prophecy says? Genesis 3.15, you shall bruise his heel, but he shall crush your head. That is a fatal blow to our adversary, the devil. There is coming a day and a time where Antichrist, where every demon of hell, where the devil himself is going to be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. They will be eternally locked up and never again will they be able to cause any harm. And that's because these feet of brass, these, these feet of Jesus are going to finally mete out judgment to our adversary, the devil. And we're going to reign with Christ forever. Also, the Bible says here, I love this one. Out of his mouth, out of the mouth of Jesus, went a sharp two-edged sword. What could that possibly mean? Now, we don't know exactly what John saw here. That's between him and the Lord. He gives us a description of what he saw, but in detail, exactly what that must have been, we don't know. But clearly it seems that there's some symbolism involved in what we're talking about here. Out of his mouth goes a sharp double-edged sword. What, what does that mean? The next time we see this sharp double-edged sword coming from the mouth of Jesus, guess where it is? Revelation 19. When the Bible says at the end of the tribulation, Jesus is going to come back. And he's going to be riding on a white horse. See, there's the rapture of the church that happens, I believe, at the beginning of the tribulation. The church will be raptured out of here. We shall receive our judgment. And then at the end of the tribulation, at the end of that seven years... 
Jesus will not stop in the clouds like he did at the rapture. No, he's going to come all the way back down to the earth, the Bible says. In Revelation 16, they're going to be gathered together at the valley of Megiddo. The Antichrist and all the satanic forces are going to be gathered together against the saints of God and against the Lord Jesus Christ to make battle. When you read Revelation 19, here's what the Word of God says. With the sharp double-edged sword that comes from the mouth of Jesus... Jesus will strike the nations. I am a gun owner. I do believe in the Second Amendment. And that's under attack these days too. That's another sermon for another time. Amen. I am a gun owner. I do believe in having guns and protecting my family. I do believe that. That's my role. That's my God-given duty. I must act as a protector and a provider for my family. So I do own some guns. But you know what? I'm not looking, you don't have to bury me with my guns when I go out of here one of these days. I'm not going to need any weapons when I come into the hereafter. When we are armed for battle at Armageddon, guess what? We won't be armed at all. You know why? Because we'll be following Jesus. And the only weapon that Christ is going to need is the Word of God that comes from His mouth. And with the Word of God, when Christ decrees it, all the enemies of God are going to be defeated with the sharp double-edged sword that comes from his mouth. You say, Pastor, are you sure about that? Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says this, The Word of God is living and active like a double-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit and of bone and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The Word of God is the most powerful weapon that you have in your hands. Take it and use it for the glory of God because Christ himself is going to take his very word and strike the nations at the end of time. He's our victorious king. Look at this also. John says his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Just another example that our Savior Jesus lives in inexhaustible glory and unapproachable light. <laughs> Amazing Amazing thing. Church, the picture you have in your mind of Jesus is the carpenter's son who walked on this planet for about 33 years. And that's precious and that's real. But that's not the only picture of Jesus we've got. This now is the picture you and I ought to be focused on. Our victorious King. Our Master Jesus. Number four. Look at this, the desire of Jesus. What does Jesus want us to do with this information that John has received here? He says, what you see, he says, write it in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. So he says a few things to him here. He says, number one, what you see, I want you to write all this in a book. In other words, he says, I want you to take note of the word of God. Now we know in this case that John was writing the scripture. But I think this is a healthy paradigm for the rest of us. You and I on a daily basis ought to be taking note of the Word of God. Because it is revelation from God Himself and it infuses into our soul the joy, the hope, and the peace that we were talking about and singing about earlier. It's the Word of God. You and I need to cling to it on a daily basis. How well are you doing, sir or ma'am, ingesting the Word of God and taking it into your life and appropriating its truth and memorizing its words? That's where our victory is going to rest. He says, what you see, write it in a book, John. And aren't you so glad that the Lord Himself commanded John to write this Word? Because if we didn't have this Word, we wouldn't have the joy that we feel here today. And then what else does he say? He says, look, this word that you write down, he says, I want you to send it to the seven churches. In other words, Jesus did not give John this revelation so he could be puffed up with pride. Jesus did not give the John the revelation so he could hoard it up and study it and keep it for himself. Jesus gave John this word. So it could be shared with the seven churches of his day and I believe with all of my heart for the church until the Lord Jesus comes back. We ought to be looking and diving into this revelation because in it we find hope and life and victory. All that to say 
that the Word of God that has been placed in us, the gospel that we have received, the grace that we now enjoy should not be kept to ourselves. The Lord has given you this Word. The Lord has given you the gospel. And what He intends you to do with it now is not just to hoard it up to yourself, but to go and share it with others who need to know that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I don't think I need to remind you There are a lot of people out there today who are not convinced that Jesus is king. It's just, I don't know if you feel the same way as I do about this, but I think that our culture, even right here in good old East Tennessee where the Bible belt buckles, has become increasingly secular. The more that we've been given to these phones, this technology, this media, all this stuff, you see more a nationalizing of the public opinion. And the Christian worldview is not a part of that. And so we live in a secular culture where people do not know Jesus and in some cases have not even any idea that there is something, maybe they know there's something missing from their life, but they don't know it's Christ. What a great opportunity we have. Why do you think we're ringing the bell at Walmart on Saturday? Is it because there's not something else better to do? Is it because that we want to fill ourselves with time and fill our calendar with obligations? And The reason we're ringing the bell at Walmart on Saturday is because we want people to know that Jesus is the Christ. We're going to be handing out John 3.16 tracts. You know what John 3.16 says? God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. You know how many people wonder if God really loves them today? We're going to be sharing with people this Saturday, God loves you. And if you feel empty, if you you feel like you don't know where you're going, you don't know what the plan, the purpose for the rest of your life is, here it is right here. Every problem you have, every mistake you've made, every sin that you've committed can all be forgiven and blotted out. Because you've got a God that loves you and sent sent you His Son, Jesus. Whether you're there Saturday or not, I hope that many of you will pray and think about being there Saturday. But whether you're there Saturday or not, that's a message that people all across this community and all across this planet need to hear that Jesus is Lord and that He loves them and will save them. We've got to share this message. Jesus wants His message shared with the churches and beyond the churches. Number five. How about this? This is such a sweet piece. What a sweet way to remember as we come to the close of this counterculture series. What a great reminder. As we try to live counterculture, look, it's the presence of Jesus in verse 20. He talks about the seven stars and the seven golden lampstands. Jesus explains it. I was reading that a minute ago and some of y'all said, what in the world is this? The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, the Bible says. Now what does that mean? Does that mean that God has a guardian angel assigned perhaps to every local church? Well, maybe. Maybe God's done that. He hadn't told us that. We know the Bible says that a a battle is always constantly waging in the heavens. Powers and principalities and forces of wickedness in heavenly places. So surely God could have done something like that and maybe is doing something like that. But I think the meaning here is something even a little different than that. He says that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now, angel in the Greek New Testament is angelos. And it could be speaking of a heavenly being, of an angel, if you will. But sometimes the word angelos is translated messenger. Messenger. Conservative evangelicals typically typically translate that and take that to mean that this was something that was given to the messengers of the local church. And in this case, the church in Thyatira, Pergamos, Laodicea, they had pastors, they had messengers. And what does God say about that? He says the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. As you continue to read the Revelation, you know what the Bible says here? That those stars are held in the hand of Jesus. 
It reminds me of what the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. God says to His nation Israel, He said, I will give you shepherds according to my heart who will feed you with knowledge and with understanding. That is to say that every true pastor, every shepherd, every messenger of our Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't matter if they're in this state or this country or in the other parts of the world. I was, I was watching this morning. I hope you go watch it. I shared it this morning. A Russian pastor breaking off the ice around a body of water so that they could baptize saints of God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That faithful pastor is held in the hands of his Savior, Jesus Christ. What a wonderful blessing that is. And then look at this church. It says, The seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. And what does the Bible say here that Jesus was doing in the midst of those lampstands? He was walking amid the, amid the lampstands. That tells me Jesus was present among the lampstands. That's to say then that Jesus is present among His churches. Among every true church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, we acted like this or thought about this when we came in here today. Jesus is present with us today. The Bible says He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's everywhere at all times. So Christ, even as we worship now, is present among our church. He's the head of this church and of every church. He's our Lord and Master. I take great solace in knowing that as we continue to do the work of our Savior Christ, that the pastors, the men of God, are held safe in the hands of Jesus and the churches get to experience the presence of Jesus as we carry out His gospel mission. I don't know if you've thought about it or not, but as we think about bringing this counterculture series to an end, nobody was more counterculture than Jesus. Over and over again, He rebuked the devil. He resisted temptation. He enraged the Jews. He fell under the scorn of the Roman Empire. And then all along the way, He pointed us to the Heavenly Father. If anybody ever in the history of this planet lived counterculture, it was Christ. And now that Jesus that we talked about earlier, that we've been talking about this entire time, that same Jesus has ascended to the right hand of God. The Bible says He has sat down at the right hand of God. One of these days, Jesus is going to stand up. And he is going to come back and he's going to retrieve his church. Until that time comes, the point of this entire series of messages has been this. We can follow the devil. We can follow the crowd. And we can live for ourselves, Or we can follow our Savior Christ. We can be obedient to his word. And we can live for the glory of God. And if, in fact, you have signed up for Jesus, you signed up for the last option. And I've got a word for you. It's not going to be easy. As you've already experienced throughout your life, it's going to be difficult to live for Christ. That's why a few people, and a lot of people start out on the course, so they say, so they think, living for Christ, only to give up later when they found out that it was going to cost them something. Let me remind you and let me pray. Jesus said, if a man is going to build a tower. He's going to build something. He first counts the cost. And then he builds. I'm going to say it like this and I want to pray. Following Jesus will cost you everything you have. But you must decide today, am I willing to count the cost to pay the price and to follow the Lord Jesus Christ until He calls me home. Even if that means living counterculture, am I determined to keep following Jesus instead of following the crowd?